Good morning, everybody. This is Nili Dora Ella, the director of the Laughter Therapy School, and I'm very, very, very happy and excited to be here this morning with you. This is our first uh, live TV broadcast, and we have a very unique and very special guest, especially from Australia. Uh, before I start this interview, it's very important for me to say that it will be held in English because our special guest is Amanda Gore and her uh, mother tongue is English, so the entire interview will be held in English. However, your questions Sorry. can be sent via the chat box, which is right underneath the screen uh, where this, uh, vi this um, the TV is uh, in Hebrew, and I can translate it for Amanda. You're more than welcome to send your comments, and, uh, and we'll uh, read them and translate them so Amanda can respond and, uh, and answer your questions. So, uh, Amanda, can you hear me? Loud and clear, and I'm sorry if those poor people had to look at me the whole time you were speaking, but shalom, shalom. <laughs> Okay, so I hear you very well, and uh, I, I can tell you that for me, it's um, it's very a special moment, not just because this is the first live uh, um, TV show, because I think it, it was about a year ago that I came across your video, and I was so excited, and I really wanted to meet you and talk to you, and I said, okay, I'll uh, become friend, uh, friendly with my amygdala <laughs> and overcome my fear and just write you an email and see if you'll be able, you know, if you respond, and you responded positively, and I'm so thankful and grateful that you're here with us. And I want to say a little bit about you so the audience will uh, know a little bit about your background. Amanda Gore is called People Whisperer. She's a communication and performance expert who for 25 years has been helping people achieve results by reconnecting them to, reconnecting them to what really drives perception, attitude, behavior, engagement, joy, and positive outcomes in business and life. Her expertise in transforming the spirit of people and culture creates changes in perceptions, improves relationships and leadership, connects and engages people, and reframes the value of change. With decades of exper experience speaking in over 20 countries to all types of corporation, groups, and association, combined with constant research in scientific discovery, Amanda will uh, entertain, change perception, behaviors, and attitudes, and move you to action. She teaches people how to bring out the best in themselves and others and how to keep a positive spirit no matter what the circumstances. Author of oh, five good. books, is she's going to show us at least one of them, and several DVD and audio training programs. She has a bachelor's degree in physiotherapy and a major in psychology and expertise in ergonomics, group dynamics, stress management, neurolinguistics, and emotional intelligence. Good morning. Okay, stop. Good <laughs> it's it's, it's good morning man. here and good evening in Australia, right? <laughs> Uh, it is. It's, uh, the sun is just starting to set. If I look out, just about to set over the ocean. Okay. So, Amanda, um, I think you have a very special, you know, personal story, other than all these formal uh, facts about your life and about your, you as, a, you know, as an expert and a motivator speaker, a famous speaker all over the world. Can you tell us a little bit about the turning point uh, because I think you were born with this gift, but you made it into a profession. Uh, you know, some people say, find what you love, make it a profession, and you'll never have to work a day in your life. And that's what you yes. did eventually. <laughs> yeah. Well, I never really wanted to. I didn't even know you could be a speaker, Nelly. To cut a long story short, I, I can't even remember how old I was now, but it's about 25, 30 years ago. And uh, I had been, I was a physiotherapist, physical therapist, working in Australia Post, actually, in occupational health. And I had co-authored a book with um, another guy, and it was called The Office Athlete. So somebody asked me to speak at a conference, and then I met a man who is still the best speaker I've ever met in my life, and uh, he said, you should be a speaker. And I said, well, what's a speaker? And he then explained it to me, and I've just had this blessed journey ever since. But it wasn't always about joy. The joys really only come in... Hmm, I guess I knew I, I knew I had to write a book on joy, or I was supposed to be writing a book on joy for probably, uh, say, uh, five, six years ago. Yeah, five or six years ago. 
But I just couldn't do it. I had a lot of trouble trying to write it, which I'd never had before with books. I could always write them very easily. And um, this story is rather poignant because we're talking about joy today. And when I wrote the book, um, it was when we moved to Vermont. So I'd set aside a month to write it because I finally thought, this is ridiculous. I've been trying to write this book forever. I'd done mind maps. I'd done everything. I couldn't do it. So I said, stop, that's it, I'm going to write it in February. I'm not speaking, I'm not going anywhere, I'm just going to write the book. Well, the, two days into February that year, um, I got a phone call from Australia. I was living in America and my mum uh, had broken her leg. So I went home and she died about two weeks later and I was absolutely devastated. However, uh, I think she had a tremendous influence on my life after that because within a very short space of time of going back to Dallas, and if any of you have been to America, Dallas is like central yeah. and it's, you know, dry, flat. It's not the prettiest of places. Um, within a very short time of going back, we had moved to Vermont, which is probably one of the most beautiful places and isolated in America. And we were living in a tiny farmhouse on 25 acres with magnificent views that it was a perfect place to write. And I did, but I didn't realize it. You know, I wasn't conscious of it at the time. We just moved to Vermont. And then one morning, a couple of weeks after I arrived there, I woke up. And I didn't have, I haven't had experiences like this before. So I'm not a space cadet, I promise, those of you listening. Um, but I woke up and I just knew that mum had put together some kind of spiritual writing committee. And if I meditated each morning, they would download and tell me what to write. So I went, okay. And I hadn't done anything like that before, so I thought, well, I'll try it. Well, blow me down if I didn't sit and meditate, and then I'd go away and I'd write 35 pages on something about which I knew not very much, really. And I hadn't done any research. I hadn't done the usual stuff I did. So it was a, a really unusual process. And that was a defining moment when the book was finished because it, it turned everything I did towards joy. So it was a very long answer. Sorry, Millie. <laughs> That's a beautiful story, and now I find another common thing with you. I lived in New Hampshire for six years, so I uh, I know Vermont, and it's a beautiful <laughs> it's a beautiful yeah. place. And it's interesting um, when you really connect with your inner self, and then you're guided, and uh, every you know the universe is uh, is all with you in order to uh, get your present and gift out there, and it's. It's so moving and touching. So thank you for taking the time to, you know, to share this, uh, uh, this story. So yes, the, our subject for today is joy. And I know that you have a very special definition of joy. Can you uh, share this definition with us? Because a lot of people, well, I think, mix happiness with joy. And, and um... Well, I, I'm not sure which definition, because there's like a million of them, nearly. I think I can't remember which ones I've got. But to me, it's a real inside-outside thing. Um, people are looking, the number one thing that people think they want in life is happiness. But the truth is they want joy. And, uh, but they're not quite sure what joy is. And happiness really is just the beginning. And most people look for happiness. They search for happiness, which means they're looking outside themselves. But we're all born with joy. We're born with this astonishing innate capacity to uh, be joyful and to feel joy all the time. Now, it's not easy. You know, if it was easy, we'd all be doing it, wouldn't we? Yeah. But it, takes, it does take work. Yeah. And, and to me, the simplest, that, what, what I was given, and forgive me if you don't believe in God, if you can substitute Buddha, Allah, Spirit, Source, Divine, whatever it is. Yeah. But I was given that the true path to joy is to, number one, connect with God, and number two, serve others. And whether you even want to call that the God within, because I was also told that we're all holograms. You know what a hologram is? Um, yes. If you, have, if you have a hole and you break it into little pieces, the hole appears in each tiny little piece. That's what a hologram is. And, and we're all holograms of the, the divine realms, the universe. But it's hard to get your head around that we're all astonishing beings of light because we keep looking in a mirror and going, you're ugly or you're fat, or, <laughs> or yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So was that the sort of definition that you were meaning? 
Really? Yeah, yeah, because I think that um, a lot of the times happiness is something that, um, as far as I'm concerned, is also something that, um, that has conditions. When I'll lose weight, when I'll have a boyfriend, when I have money, then I'll be happy. And then sometimes we do achieve those goals, but then this happiness okay. is very temporarily. Yeah. <laughs> and joy, I think, is the state of mind. Yeah. Well, and a state of heart, really. Yeah. You know, it's possible to be joyful, even in the middle of tragedy. I remember a, a woman who became like a sister to us in Vermont, um, Uh, demonstrated one of the stepping stones to joy because the other thing that I discovered that they taught me was that there are 12 stepping stones to joy really and the first and uh, only the first that you can't go past go and and this is go gratitude gratitude is the first stepping stone once you step to it then you can go and dance between the other 11 stones but gratitude's got to be the first one the first one And because uh, it's impossible to have a heart full of misery and a heart full of gratitude at the same time. You can't have a heart full of misery and a heart full of gratitude at the same time. So this friend of ours, Brenda, um, has a very, very close-knit family. And one day her nephew, actually I think it was two of her nephews. Yeah, I think it was two nephews. They were riding snowmobiles and they came up to the peak of a hill and crashed into each other. And one of them was very, very severely injured. And while she was hanging on to his two sobbing sisters, this total sense of grace really descended on her. And within this tragic drama, she felt complete inner peace. And that's the last stepping stone. It's equanimity. But nobody knows what equanimity means, so I'm changing to inner peace. Um, okay. It's really... Happiness, people perceive it as, la, 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 I'll be laughing and smiling all the time. But joy is something where inner peace is part of it. In tragedy, you can find elements of joy. Exactly. It's to be in the center of the storm and not like respond to uh, what's happening outside of you. And it's very yeah. interesting because I was a student at UNH in New Hampshire and I was going through a very difficult time and there was a, like a personal crisis. And I remember coming to one of my Indian friends and saying to her, you know, thank God. And I was appreciating everything I had. And she said, this is so nice of you that you remember times in, you know, in times of sorrow and also in times of happiness. So the fact that like to um, appreciate what we have and, and, uh, and uh, um, express our gratitude, I, uh, what I do on a daily basis, and this is something that I've started practicing only recently, is I say, I say thank you to everything that's obvious in my life, that everything that's good that happened to me, and to all the challenges that I'm facing because I know this is a part of my growth here. So uh, and to be able to look at challenges and difficulties and see what's in it for you and be able to thank those challenges, uh, I think this is what really uh, brings the, you know, the joy that you're talking about and also this inner peace. Well, I, one of the things I talk about in my seminars, and, and we even sell them on the website, the Joy Project website, thejoyproject.com, um, if, if everybody does this, I know it's silly, <laughs> you make circles of your fingers and you go Okay, like this, here though. we go. I'm doing yes. it with you. <laughs> and you're probably your poor technician you're going to force to do as well. But these are your gratitude glasses. Okay. And although they're silly, they're a great cheap symbol. And when you're sitting there feeling miserable about something, all you've got to do is force <laughs> yourself to put your gratitude glasses on and that reminds you to start to look for something for which to be grateful within the circumstances or within your life if you can't find anything within the current circumstances. And the other crucial thing for me is how do we teach this to our children? Because, mm. you know, you think about it. How do we teach kids gratitude? We look at them when they're, you know, toddlers and we say, say thank you to your brother. And they So say thank you to your brother. I said say thank you to your brother. You know, we think that's teaching them gratitude. I don't think so. <laughs> so what we do is to sit around the dinner table at night and all of us put our gratitude glass on from when they're little, just from when they're toddlers, because they love gratitude glasses. And uh, even 14-year-olds will do this if they've never done it before, because I tried it on my godchildren in America. Yeah. And the 14-year-old was the first one to do it, a boy, And much as I said, okay, kids, we're going to put on our gratitude glasses and talk about what we're grateful for today, I didn't expect him to do this bit. Well, he did. And, of course, because he did, his sisters did. 
So gratitude glasses are one um, specific little tip that you can take away from today. It's a silly thing, but it's memorable. And you can, honestly, you can transform your life with gratitude glasses. <laughs> and it's interesting like, you know, because it's like creating an anchor on one thing. Uh, and yeah. the other thing is that, uh, so your body remembers every time you put those gratitude glasses that you're uh, grateful. And the other thing is that you're a role model. It's not that you're asking people to do it. You're doing it yourself and everybody joins you and it's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was doing it with you so everybody can, <laughs> can put their I'm gratitude glasses hang on Here's yeah <laughs> amanda is bringing a gratitude glasses <laughs> there okay <laughs> now that you put them on and people can't help but laugh but it sure reminds you to be grateful even if you've had a fight with your partner you know go to bed and be naked with these on staring at them it's very hard to stay in for a long time <laughs> I must yeah. be more often myself, actually. <laughs> so you, know, you can walk around with them on your head, and they're much too big, of course, but that's part of the joy in it. It's being silly when things are all tense and difficult in life. Exactly. And, and do this to your teenagers. It drives them nuts. So, and it's a great lesson for them. You know, they'll stomp off and go, oh, mum. But if you find reasons to be grateful for teenagers, then, oh, i tell you the other thing that gratitude glasses do for you, they bust stress. Yeah. Because, um, you know, truthfully about stress, a lot of people have trouble sleeping. sleeping. So they'll fall asleep. I'll take them off because I can see myself. Uh, they'll fall asleep as soon as they go to bed, but they wake up at 3 a.m., can't go back to sleep. Or they go to bed exhausted and they can't fall asleep. Or they can't sleep because their partner snores. But usually these are all related to stress. Exactly. And when you go to sleep and you worry, there are two main stress hormones that are released. And the first is adrenaline. And the second is cortisol. Adrenaline's not so bad, it just destroys your kidneys. But cortisol actually um, destroys every organ in the body, sits in the brain for about five hours and eats brain cells. It's literally a toxic bath for your brain. And it puts on abdominal fat. So, you know, if you're going to lie in bed and worry before you go to sleep, you're making yourselves fat, sick and stupid. FSS, <laughs> 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 okay. Stress, stress is at the source of all disease. But, you know, joy, on the other hand, makes you thin and smart and uh, creative and healthy. Because when you're joyful and you do silly things like this, it actually increases the number of dendrites connecting the neurons in your brain. So, you know, it sets up those little connectors and the neurotransmitters. Exactly. So much as that's a simplistic definition. It's really pretty important, and gratitude is the start of everything. It's the start with, yeah, you know that I'm an expert on, on laughter therapy and laughter coaching, and uh, a lot of yes. people come to my workshops and say that they don't, they have sleeping disorders, and they haven't slept for five or ten years, one night straight, and they don't believe that it's going to help them, but every time I get an SMS in the morning, wow, this is the first night that I've slept all night and it was a quality sleep. So obviously we know that laughter uh, takes care of those hormones as well and releases the stress and tension you're talking about yeah. and people can have um, sleep better and also uh, reconnect with their uh, inner joy. Can you talk a little bit, um, expand on those uh, um, joy milestones? You're talking about 12 of them. I was looking at them and I said, wow, a few of them are my strong muscles because I practice them and they come naturally and they're like automatic in my life, but some of them I need to practice. <laughs> well, you know, nearly of the 12 stepping stones, almost all of them, except for laughter in your case, people, <clears throat> excuse me, need to practice them because it's not natural stuff. You know, there's, I have to read them because I can remember about 10 each time, but I never remember all of them. Gratitude, of course, is the first one. Then there's, um, here's the book. It looks like a messy copy, but here it is, The Gospel of Joy. Uh, compassion and Grace, Hope, Reverence, Generosity, Giving and Receiving, Forgiveness. Now, don't tell me that we don't all need to practice that one. Every yes. day. <laughs> That's for sure. That's a big one for me. <laughs> yes. Energy and vitality, listening, laughter, love, that's always one that we can do better with, cheerful enthusiasm, no matter what happens, and equanimity or inner peace is the last one. And so what we tried to do in the book was to um, give people simple daily exercises for a week. So every day for a week, there's a little task you set. And one of them is to wear gratitude glasses all day. Now, you don't have to wear the physical ones unless you want to. 
but um, they're that simple. However, every cell in the body is replaced every 30 days. And so, including the brain cells. So if you change your thinking for 30 days in a row, by the time all the cells have been reproduced and replaced, you've actually changed the way you think. You've changed your beliefs. You've changed the way you operate. So that's why we structured it the way it is. And um, each chapter and each stepping stone uh, takes you through seven days of little exercise. And we, we, we created an online learning program too because some people don't want to read. They want more interactive stuff online. And that's longer because we spread it out a bit further and added a few extra exercises and put in videos and have places where you can comment. But uh, do you want me to talk about any particular one, Nilly? Yes. Uh, I'd like you to talk about forgiveness because this is a big one, I think, uh, for a lot of us. And also, if, you think, if we think of you know, the country that I live in, it's a war zone. And I think that the only way to bring about peace, first of all, inner peace, is to forgive ourselves. And uh, then we'll be able to forgive others as well. Uh, so that's uh, one thing that I'd like you to talk and about love. You know, we're before Valentine's. It's celebrated all over the world. So let's take those two. <laughs> okay. Well, let's do forgiveness first because it's, it's not easy. Uh, the, you know, the number one predictor of heart attack is someone who has an angry, hostile heart. And forgiveness is really all about separation. It's, it's um, unless you see yourself as a part of the whole and that every other being on earth is a part of the whole, you're separated. And that's one of the biggest uh, blocking points for joy because when you can be one with everything which is a monumental task I might add you know it's like that's like the enlightened state it's what most human beings wait a second is Amanda is stuck <laughs> oh what happened are you there yes I'm here but you were stuck you um something oh. froze for a second but I think you're okay now <laughs> Back now. So could you hear anything I said? You can repeat the last two sentences. Oh my God. You can okay. Back and remember <laughs> okay. Um, I think I was saying, you know, we, we're born and we, we separate. And then humans spend the rest of their experience on earth trying to become one again and trying to become connected. So forgiveness is about separation. When you see someone outside you as causing something. This is a big concept. So before you react and stop breathing, anybody that's listening, just keep breathing as we go through it. Because <laughs> there, there are, you know, you can perceive people out there doing things to you. And by, if you look at it from earthly eyes, yes, that's true. If you look at it from a higher perspective, then things all happen for a reason. And forgiveness Really, in fact, there's a great quote, but I can't. I, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to find the source of it. And it's, unforgiveness is like drinking poison yourself and waiting for the other person to die. Exactly. So it's never going to happen. You, on the other hand, will get sick with the anger, the resentment that builds up inside that sense of revenge. So number one, forgiveness is all about separation. And when you connect to the God within, you connect to your inner self. And you realize that we are really all part of the whole and everybody has a purpose. And there are monumental reasons for what's going on that we will never understand from our teeny little perspective. Then it helps you to make better choices. And then you can choose to forgive somebody. And it doesn't mean that you're magically going to feel transformed. It doesn't magically take away feelings of pain and hurt. But if you make the choice to forgive someone else, if you make the choice to try to see how we are all one, if you make the choice to see that you can change and by you changing others will, then life becomes a little easier and we move closer to that concept of forgiveness. It's almost like forgive them, Father, for they know what, not what they do. And, and that came to me while I was writing the book. Most people have, including us, have no concept of what we're doing. And, you know, I, I think of a, a few arguments my husband and I have had in the last few days where we bring up all the old crap that we've had going on. 
for seven years. And I teach this stuff, you know, I teach this stuff. And we're still doing it. Exactly. And, and I have to constantly remind myself to go back to forgiveness and work to do it. It's not easy. You know, you'll all know that. It's not like you go, oh, well, I think I'll choose to forgive him today. He's done this for the 497th time, but I'm going to just forgive him again and feel bad. <laughs> I don't think so. It takes, first of all, it takes awareness because I've got to become aware that I'm feeling bitter and twisted. And, and secondly, it takes me time to control my emotions and get out of the emotions and reconnect with God. Thirdly, I have to remind myself we are all one and he's a mirror. And fourthly, then I have to make the conscious decision to forgive. And I may not forget, but I can move on and I don't have to dwell on what's happened. So with an enormous topic like forgiveness, that's just kind of a little nutshell. Is, is that enough on that one, Nilly? Yes. <laughs> I think that a lot of the times people, uh, it's exactly what you're saying. You, when you're in the midst of a fight, uh, we're all in like on a survival level and our aware awareness goes right outside, you know, out the window. And it's just bringing it back into the conversation and being aware of who you are and who's right in front of you and going through this motion because a lot of people say, how can I forgive them? You know, how do I do that? So it's really practice. And first it's, it's becoming aware and uh, being present uh, and then, then being able to run this process inside yourself and then be able to, like you said, not forget, but forgive, uh, you know, not for, your, for your own <laughs> sake and for the other people. You know, the other thing, Nelly, is very important to let go. I know that has yeah. taken me years and years and years to get better at. And I describe it on stage as if we're all carrying around um, a sack of potatoes. So if you imagine you've got a big sack of potatoes on one side and an empty sack on the other, you're going to take out a potato for every person that's done you wrong, every time they've done it wrong, <laughs> and then every situation in your life that's wrong, and you write their name on the potato and you put it into the other bag. And then you pick up the second bag of potatoes full of names and you carry it with you everywhere, everywhere you, you go, <laughs> every day for the rest of your lives. And, you know, I say to people, what happens to a bag of potatoes after about six weeks? Yeah. Well, it goes moldy and fungusy and it stinks and it turns to liquid. Well, you're carrying that on the inside. That's if you choose not to forget. As a funny story, a woman came up to me at the conference in the States. She'd seen me speak a year before and she'd heard me tell the story about the potatoes. And she said she'd gone home and she sat outside in the back garden one day and she, she wrote her husband's name on about 100 potatoes <laughs> and she threw it onto the lawn. And that later that weekend, her husband came in furious because he'd been trying to mow the lawn. And he said, what are all those potatoes doing in the backyard? <laughs> and and was, was my name written all over them? It was very funny. <laughs> Probably not very funny there, but I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. So give it a go. You know, write it on potatoes and throw the potatoes. Well, that's a waste of potatoes. So boil the potatoes maybe. Exactly. Boil up, you know. Let go of the stuff. Because so a lot we of hang on. But with the stories that we tell ourselves, and, and this ties nicely into love um, because into both of them, it's a good segue. You know, life is about perceptions. It's not about reality. We never see the whole picture. When we're not high enough spiritual beings or we're not developed enough, some people are, but not many are developed enough to actually see the whole, to see everything that is being orchestrated in a miraculous and magical way, the good and the bad. And so all we do is see our own little image. That's all we see. And we think that's reality. It's not. It's just our perceptions. And those perceptions create beliefs. For example, it's a very personal story, but some of you it may make sense too. I, I, my father was an alcoholic, and my parents split up when I was five. Well, after my mum died, I found out that she had actually had a nervous breakdown and left us with my father in India, where we were at the time, mm. for a year to go and have treatment. Well, I, I honestly, I thought I had an idyllic childhood. I knew my dad was an alcoholic, but my mum loved me. I, I thought I had a great childhood. So I never looked at my childhood as a source of problems, and I certainly never knew that she had left for a year. But after I found that out and I started to look at patterns in my life, I realized that when I was three, which is the time about when I, she would have left, first of all, 
I would have felt abandoned by my mum if nobody told me what was going on. And because I had no memory of it, I guess no one told me. And B, my father drank to deal with... So my mum had to go because she was ill and needed treatment and couldn't get in India. And B, my father drank to deal with his problems. But as a three-year-old, I'm pretty certain I internalised that as I wasn't worth loving. Mm. And I didn't become aware of that till I was about 50. And I was reading a book called Adult Children of Alcoholics, which I thought, oh, there are some interesting patterns going on here that match what's in this book. And so that awareness is critical. And the stories we tell ourselves are everything. So when it comes to love and Valentine's Day, I'm just writing an article at the moment actually called Are You a Good Lover? Okay. And I don't mean the, you know, are you great in bed like yeah. Cosmo <laughs> But are you a good lover? In other words, how well do you love someone else? Mm. And one of the key things I think is that we all think we know how to give love because we never think about it. I mean, you just, you just, well, I love you and you do stuff and that's supposed to be loving to the other person. Well, there, there's a couple of books written on this, but I reckon the simplest way to look at it is to actually ask someone. And I, and I realized this because I was... Um, in a relationship with a chap called Anton. And I came from, my, my mum used to make us a celebrity on our birthdays. You know, it lasted the whole day, there was a build-up, there was a fade-out, there were lots of presents, oh, it was a lot of fun. Well, Anton, on his 35th birthday, was given two tea towels by his whole family. So we came from a very different place. Right. <laughs> and my idea of showing somebody I loved them was showering them with lots of silly little things like my mum used to do for me. <laughs> So one day, I thought, oh, fabulous, I know, I'll give him a real surprise. And I don't know if you have those little tiny weeny confetti hearts yes. in Israel. <laughs> yes, we do. Well, <laughs> I got a whole box of them. And I got his briefcase. I knew he was going to an important meeting. So I thought, oh, he's going to love this. I poured all these little hearts into his briefcase. So that when he sat at the meeting and opened the briefcase, <laughs> All these little hearts. Now, all morning I'm thinking, oh, he's going to love this. It's going to be fabulous. He's going to come home. He's going to say, oh, my, that was fantastic. Blah, blah, blah. Wrong. Surprise. Wrong. <laughs> and, and, you know, I really thought I was being loving. So a long story to explain. I reckon the secret is that we have to ask people how they feel loved. And the way to do it is to say, and watch my hands if you can. I'll, I'll try to go back a bit so you can see them. It's, what do I do that makes you feel that I love you? With very gentle hand gestures. You can't sort of flick them around and, because it's important in, in terms of nonverbal. But the question is, what do I do that makes you feel that I love you? And, you know, if they say to you, oh, I feel loved when you hug me. You can't say, uh, no, no, sorry, when you married me or when you found me, I didn't hug. I don't do hugs. I'm not a hugger, not me. <laughs> if you don't say that, don't ask the question. And what's more, do this with your children because we think we know how to give love to our children and we probably do, but there will be some things that make them feel more loved than some of the other things that you do. And it's always a wise question to ask them. So I think that's a great Valentine's Day gift to give your partner and your children and your parents maybe. I don't know. So it's like do not assume. Ask. Ask the other person. Ask your partner. Ask your children. Ask your parents how would you like, how would they like uh, you to love them? <laughs> uh, well, and they'll teach you how to express their love the way they want them uh, or the way they feel loved, right? But remember, it's how you ask the question. It's really important. Although it sounds like a simple question, it's designed really carefully. So it's what do I do that makes, that makes you feel, feel that, that I, I love, love you. you? And when you dare asking the question and they answer, you need to dare step out of your comfort zone and deliver. <laughs> yes. yes. And, yeah. and, you know, they say hugging and you're not comfortable with hugging, you can say, well, you know, I've, I've never really been comfortable with hugging, but I truly do love you, and I will try. Forgive me if I'm a little stiff at first, but if you are, you need to hug. It's really important. Touch keeps you alive. Touch so keeps, yeah, and whatever, people, 
if when it comes to health you need to give 12 hugs a day in order to be healthy and sane <laughs> there you go see so if you don't hug you're obviously insane exactly <laughs> you know i um as part of being a <laughs> as part of being a business woman and having my own business you know myself whenever there are conferences and i'm short so i go i step on a uh, on a chair and i wait for everybody to come in and people you know used to think that i'm a, i am a hugger but i was doing it not only for them i was doing it also for myself and the more people yeah. I, you know i have a, uh, an option to interact with so many people so i can get so many hugs uh and of course i open my uh arms and i invite them to hug me i don't um i don't force anyone to hug me which is you know yeah. goes uh with what you say about love it's like uh an open invitation uh and not something that i force myself upon anyone um can you talk you know we're talking about all those uh beautiful things and we chose two uh my step step stepping stones right for yes. joy for uh joy and but a lot of people say but you know i have um awful thoughts and i think negatively and i work in a very negative environment and uh and they have all kinds of obstacles how can they live a joyful life when they have to, uh either it has to do with themselves because they feel awful or they think uh negative thoughts or the environment is not very uh uh positive how can they handle those situations how can they overcome those difficulties or challenges well remember it's the stories you tell yourself about everything really about people your boss your job it's not reality and and there will still be some people sitting here going well she doesn't work in my workplace where everybody sucks well look you may be surrounded by very negative people but do you have to take that on now if it's really bad go go somewhere else mm-hmm. where it's more positive you're not a victim you And some people, of course, who are, they have this victim mentality, will go, well, I can't go anywhere else. I, I can't find another job. And in many cases, that's true. In which case, you always have control over your choices and the way you think and the stories you tell yourself. If you're telling yourself the story that everybody at work is so negative, I hate them all, they all hate me, I hate my boss, I hate my job, he's such an arrogant pig, stop it, stop it, stop it, and become a good finder. And that's something else that is in the book. I think it's in the gratitude chapter. Um, when I was in America, I used to go to a Methodist church by chance because it was around the corner and they had a great choir. And the preacher was fantastic. And one day he told a story about a thousand successful people, successful in every aspect of it, you know, happy at work, um, successful at work, making good money, successful at home, good families, all that sort of stuff. And they did a study to see what the common denominator was. And the own, they had to invent a term. It wasn't socioeconomic status. It wasn't um, uh, a, a, a education. It wasn't any of the things that you would have expected. It was, in fact, that they were good finders. So these people consciously found the good in every single person they met. They found the good in every situation they were in. And again, it comes back to gratitude. So you, people who are miserable with their lives... who are miserable with their lot, miserable with their work, have an old pattern story going in their heads, on and on and on and on. Usually it's linked to fear, which we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. I want to talk about joy tribes and fear too, uh, nearly before we finish. Yeah. But, but you've got this negative loop going on in your head, this story that keeps reinforcing how bad everything is. Stop it. And honestly, you need to look in the mirror sometimes and go, stop it, just stop it. And... and <laughs> Play like that. Go, stop it. Stop thinking like that. Exactly. And even if you have to write down, I am a good finder. I am a good finder. And another little trick we have in the book is to imagine that everybody's wearing a little note on their forehead, a little sticky post-it note yeah. that says, God lives here. God <laughs> lives here. And, and treat everybody as if God lives there. Because somewhere inside there, there is God. There is God, yes. Yeah. But if you're looking at them in the story you tell them, Is you are the most negative schmuck this side of the black stump. I don't know how you wake up in the morning. They don't care, but you're making yourself very miserable. Yeah, exactly. So really it's a lot about the, what you say to yourself and the stories that you're telling yourself. And truly, they are just stories. See, people say, <clears throat> I'm shy. I've always been shy. I was born shy. shy. <laughs> no, you weren't. <laughs> Thomas was shy. 
Somewhere along your childhood, someone said to you more than twice, you're shy. Or don't worry about her, she's shy. So the story you start telling yourself after that is, I'm shy. Well, you're not shy, you can be whatever you want to be. You're not used to it. You're not used to being um, uh, extrovert and out there and talking to everybody, but you're not genetically shy. And so being the good finder and recognizing that everything really is about the story we're telling ourselves and the fact that you have control over those stories, exactly. it's not always easy because you have to become aware of the stories, then catch yourself as you're doing the story and then change the story. Rewrite it. Days. <laughs> You can rewrite your stories. That's, you know, the, that's the good news. And you're saying something very important because underneath those stories, they're all attached to a, a big feeling that none of us like to admit. <laughs> it's like we're scared, we're afraid. Can you talk, elaborate, like elaborate a little bit about this fear? I, before I went online, I was writing on my Facebook that I'm going online and I said my Amy, amygdala, <laughs> He's screaming, help! This is the first time I'm doing this. <laughs> well, you're doing a great job, Nelly. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and thank you for interviewing me. Um, you know, fear, we're all living lives of habits and patterns ruled unconsciously by fear. And unconscious is the key phrase. Almost everything we do is driven by an unconscious fear. And recently I was at a Qigong retreat uh, where the guy, our Qigong master, is just fantastic, um, Ren Shu Qigong it's called, and uh, he had us look for patterns, the deep patterns of our uh, roots of our behaviors and issues and problems. And, you know, I spent a, was for two weeks, I spent two weeks exploring it. And at the end of it, I came down to, for most people, there are three key fears in life. And the first is that we're not good enough, or we're not worth loving. Yes. Now, of course, that's one of the ones that I'm dealing with, um, but I'm, I'm pretty certain almost everyone has a similar fear to some degree or not. Um, and then the second one is a fear of separation, and I think that's really the big one. Yeah. We don't realize that's the big one, but that's the biggie. And that's why I was told that the true path to joy is to reconnect with God and serve others, because that reconnection... Is that, and again, remember, insert divine spirit, universe, Allah, Buddha, whatever you want to in when I say God. And the third is a feeling of being unsafe in some way. And I don't know, I haven't been able to explore that one more, but these are the fears. Now, the amygdala, or AMI, that I, I call it and you yep. referred to, because amygdala is too hard to say, the amygdala is a teeny little part in your brain and it's part of the limbic system. The limbic system is the Neanderthal part of the brain, if you like. It's exactly the same as it was in Neanderthal times. Now, when any, the, the trouble is, in Neanderthal times, um, a, a saber-toothed tiger would come, or there would be some significant physical threat, and Amy would go, Whoa, run now, in the wood, and your life would be saved, and it was a good thing. But these days, we don't have saber-toothed tigers. Now, if, you, if you're you know, in front of a moving car, and if you don't move fast, it's going to run you down, and your Amy goes, run now, that's a good thing. You should run. Exactly. But the trouble is it doesn't happen very often. What happens more often is that someone says, you need to change. And your Emmy goes, whoa, no, run, run, you're going to die, you're going to die. <laughs> or someone says, um, uh, we need to do something differently. No, 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 we're going to die, we're going to die. Someone says, you need to stand up in public and, and do a presentation. Ah, we're dead, we're dead already. Yeah. No, the Emmy just overreacts. So we have to retrain it. So the next time, I want you to go away, and I, I talk about farking, which is about F-A-R-C, okay? F is for focus, A is for awareness, uh, R is for repetition, and C is for celebration. And that's how we change our brain, literally neuro, in neuroscience. So you're going to focus on the fears that you to date have been unconscious of and discover them. So shine a light on them. Then you're going to become aware of how those fears drive your behaviors, and then you're going to repeat the new behaviors you'd rather have. And, and we're going to insert a little clue to retrain Amy. And then we celebrate the successes. So the way you retrain Amy is when you're farking, is to you recognize the fear and you think, now, is that relevant? Do I have to move fast? Is there a moving car about to come on top of me? And if not, if it's just a potential 
perceived psychological fear, then you go like this. You say, thank you, Emmy, but not now. And smile with your eyes as well. Very important to smile with your eyes, otherwise your heart knows you're not smiling. And um, as silly as it sounds, if you do that often enough, you'll retrain Emmy. Because Emmy needs to be retrained. We've got to get rid of those fears. We have to become aware of them and then get rid of them because they're driving the behaviors that cause the problems in your life. And preventing and you from connecting to your inner joy. Because if you're yes. driven by those fears, then you cannot live a joyful life. So yes. you want to focus on your fear. You want to be aware of those, uh, of, of those fears uh, and, your, and your behaviors, right, that they run. And so then you want... Focus on what, sorry, focus on what it is that you want to change. Okay. I led you astray. Focus on what it is that you want to change. Become aware of the fears driving the behaviors you want to change. Okay. Then repeat the new behaviors and the thank you, Annie, but not now. <laughs> and then you celebrate any small changes. That you, that you, uh, that you have succeeded to overcome uh, uh, those fears. And use Amy just for survival uh, <laughs> times and uh, just to really, like yeah. you said, when you know that you're in actually uh, in danger, but not otherwise, Amy, uh, <laughs> you know, step aside and let me do my, uh, uh, my thing. Yeah, and, and let me grow up. Let me grow up, exactly. And I know that if, um, if we were coming to like a conclusion of this interview and your slogan or your vision is to eradicate fear in order to uh, uh, live a joyful life, and I know that you have a vision. You would like to create those joy tribes all over the globe. And hope, I know that there's a, you had a student in Israel, I, and thank you because we already reconnected, so we'll see, maybe oh, we can right? start a, a, joyful, a joy tribe here in Israel. Uh, can what? you tell us a little bit about this? <laughs> I know that well, you also have a Joy University online, that that's part of like helping uh, uh, people all over the world uh, create those Joy tribes. Yeah, well, when I came back to Australia with the book, again, you know, honestly, I think the committee's in charge, and I, I didn't listen very well for a while, but it kept coming through to me that this had to, this was a global thing. And so it's evolved into something we call the Joy Project, and it's the joyproject.com. So the mission of the Joy Project is to eradicate fear. Now, interestingly, because I didn't know, I went, oh, eliminate fear. And, and I, got, I felt very strongly that I wasn't allowed to say that. I had to say eradicate. And um, I looked up the difference. Well, it's, it's interesting, really, because to eliminate polio, for example, you, you stop every person in the world having polio but the virus still lives. Yeah, okay. If you eradicate polio, you actually eradicate the virus. So it doesn't exist anymore. So it's a huge task. Our, our mission is to eradicate fear. Well, the way I believe we're meant to do it, I was, um, the image I was given is of the world as a globe, you know, like a three-dimensional globe. And with those little advent calendars at Christmas, you know, you open up a little calendar and there's a little picture behind it. Well, it was like the whole world was this series of advent windows and they would open up as people opened the book when they're reading the book and a, a candle would be lit and mm. I, I took that as to be if people read the book that they find out who they really are which is an astonishing being of light mm. and as they work through the book it's not really arduous work it's just exploration so as they explore themselves through the book they learn more and more about themselves and they do reconnect with that inner joy that's already there. And then the idea of creating a global joy movement um, emerged, basically. And my hope is that people will buy the book and they'll make a sort of a, a book club out of the reading it. And that book club becomes a joy tribe, whether it's your family or it's a group of friends and it's particularly important for women because when women are stressed, we, we need other women to support each other. Okay. And I, I, I kind of have this vision of men as well, but probably women are going to lead the movement to start off with, um, <laughs> creating joy tribes within their families or joy tribes with a small group of friends. It could be three people, it could be five, it could be six, it could be ten. And you all work your way together through the books. So one week or one month you might do gratitude. And all of you go away, you practice the exercises, you come back, you discuss what happened, you talk about how your life changed, 
or what was different. And so it, it's like, it's almost like doing your own little university, but you do it with your friends. And you work your way through each chapter. So that's the first part. Then the second part of the tribe is, as you're working your way through the book, you allow, sorry, I'll just turn my phone off, you allow um, uh, a, oh, that's my nephew, speaking of love. Love. Uh, you, sorry, everybody, a Joy Tribe mission to emerge. Yeah. And that mission can be anything you guys like that serves others in some way. And it may, I mean, Cheryl, who's my business partner in the Joy Project, she's making little capes, you know, like Superman capes uh, for children in hospitals to wear. Mm. They're little Joy capes. And she personalizes them for the kids. Uh, other people have made, instead of calling them scrapbooking clubs, they're Joy booking clubs. So they make books around the joy in their life, you know, like photo scrapbooks. Um, a couple of others have worked... Uh, helping older people in their community. Uh, others have cooked meals for single mothers who are struggling in their community. Okay. So it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's some way to serve others in your community or as troops, I don't know, make, um, make packages of stuff to send to people who are at war uh, or in occupied countries or something like that. But the choice is endless, but it, it needs to emerge out of your hearts as your real purpose. Okay. So did that explain it well enough? You really? can explain it beautifully, and I'm like running in my head that I would like to set up this uh, a tribe in my own uh, city uh, and start spreading the joy and, and doing, you know, uh, serving uh, the community. And maybe that will be the next project, uh, the commun community project of, uh, of the Laughter School. Oh, oh right. Oh, somebody and said, this is a great idea. I want to do it. Okay, this oh, is yay. Maya. Yay! <laughs> Maya, that's beautiful. Right. I'll be in touch with you and we'll start this tribe. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yes. and, and, you know, Neil, the, the only um, proviso that we made is, and I, I promise you I'm not trying to sell the book, but uh, it's supposed to be around the book yeah. so that as you all work towards... Um, as you will walk along the stepping stones yes. and you move your way through the stepping stones, it's like you're crossing the river of fear and the mm. stepping stones are the way you stay out of the, the fear water. And as you get to all of them, you reach the land of joy. And that's the land where you're connected with God and you're, you've mastered the talents and the skills of hope and forgiveness and reverence and generosity because these are things that people really very rarely think of in their lives. Yeah, we talk about listening, but, but very few people truly listen. Very few people are ever present when they're listening and seeking to understand first. Um, with hope, you know, everybody talks about hope, but when do we actually sit and mm. tease apart what hope is hope. and practice holding it a little more and practice having faith? And they're the sorts of things that if you work with as a group, as your tribe, you support each other in doing it. And when you have difficulties, you can help each other. Yeah. And then that becomes, you know, you start to influence everybody else in your families and in your circle of friends. And that's where the movement starts. That's beautiful. So the book is the one way of working uh, your way through and, and creating this tribe and supporting one another. And, and as you mentioned, the chapters from the book also appear on your website as this uh, university of uh, joy learning, right? And then uh, there there's, uh, the chapters are expanded and there are more exercises and uh, how people can practice the different uh, pillars or stepping stone as you, as you call them right now. And I really yeah. love the way you were saying um, um, beforehand, when I was saying state of mind, you were talking about a state of heart. And um, yeah. yes, and I will adopt that, uh, that new, new term, not a state of mind, but a state of heart. Ha! Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if there's uh, uh, people are asking about your book. P people can uh, purchase your book on your website, right? We'll send everybody a link to both your uh, website and to the joyproject.com. Uh, I think people can um, uh, purchase the book there and also... Oh, uh, okay. Um, if you can give us the, the link right now, we can put it on the screen so everybody can see it. 
Oh, great. Yes, it's www.thejoyproject.com. And we have two, we just released a new one. You can probably see it here. I'm not sure how clearly. Okay. But it's called the gift, the gift of Gratitude. So we took the first chapter and we made it beautiful with pictures and all that sort of stuff. So it's an easy little book if you have children. Because the Gospel of Joy is really quite a fat book. It's like 200 and something pages. And um, although it's simple, like I'm not a very complex, well, I am a complex person, but I don't <laughs> speak in a complex or complicated way. And, uh, and it's got a lot of daily exercises in it. But, you know, uh, we have it in ebook format too, Nilly, because with Australia Post, sometimes it costs more than the price of the book to ship it. Okay. So now, anybody can email me, amanda at amandagore.com. But, but sorry, don't try it Hebrew because... Okay, only English. Not... <laughs> yes, sorry. I'm sorry, I've only got one language. Okay. And um, it gets my nephew again. And I'm just on the phone, darling. I'll call you right back. <laughs> sorry, everybody. I just had to... I just had to set him straight. I adore him. He's 24. He's mm. a fabulous kid. And I hardly ever get a chance to talk to him. So as soon as we're done, I'll call him back. Thank you for letting me talk to him. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> Wait a second to say it again. Can you repeat the, the website uh, address again? It's the www. www. The, the joy project. Project. Dot com. Dot com. And you said that people can also purchase it and um, as a um, ebook, as an ebook, not just a, a, a regular book. Yeah. All right. That's, Maybe it's also good for the environment. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you've got to print it out. If you print, print it out, recently. okay. Yes. Okay. But, yeah. but yes, and, and it's a lot cheaper. I think it's like $15 for the e-book, and uh, it's, I think it's like $25 for the actual for the book. book. But uh, okay. to Israel, I'm pretty sure the shipping will be like $20. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And, and I'm the, sorry we can't make it cheaper. That's okay. Is, is it only on your website, or can people also find it in, yeah. in bookstores? No, it's a, oh, you can get it as a Kindle download, I think, okay. on Amazon. That's great. But, but it's, it's pretty much, yeah. Amanda, it's been such a pleasure uh, and such a joyful conversation. And thank you very much for uh, agreeing to give this interview, for being here with us uh, this morning. And, you know, it's your evening. Um, I've learned so much. And I'm so happy that you're my, the first one uh, to be interviewed by the laughter thing. <laughs> Me too. And I'm very, very grateful to and, you. Uh, and to and I'm sure you this. gave us so many practical tools. And I'm sure that everybody who's going to take them and use them uh, and start practicing those stepping stones will, fe will reconnect with their inner joy and, uh, and have a joyful life. And I hope that one of these days we'll meet uh, face to face. Maybe I'll be able to share with you uh, the joy tribe that was set in Israel. <laughs> Yes, yay! That'd be fantastic. <laughs> There'd be a whole lot of joy tribes and stuff. So thank all over you, the place. thank you very, very much for being with us, and thank you for your time. Uh, and I want to thank the audience for being with us uh, this morning. And um, and I'm sure that Amanda was answering a lot of your questions uh, when she was talking. And uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, see you in our next. Uh, uh, show so have a beautiful day and a very joyful day um, and thank you very much bye bye now thank you bye -bye. and thanks everybody bye don't you love Skype bye we're done.